Welcome everyone to the seminar. Uh, congratulations to the 77 of you who have tuned in on this rainy, um, rainy afternoon. So we've we've got just a very few slides. Uh, there's only 10 of them. Um, and that's really just to um, 10 plus the opening and the closing. Uh, it's just to set the scene. I thought just to warm things up a little bit, we'll just talk through why this review is happening. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to a few of the slides and hand over to uh, my colleagues uh, and then this will probably take 15-20 minutes and we'll get into, I hope, some Q&A. So you're asked to put your questions into the Q&A box, not into the chat, uh, and then they'll be forwarded through to uh, Faimutu to, uh, to put to the panel. So um, if we look at the first, the next slide, why are we doing this review? I mean, the short answer is the three of us are doing it because we've been, we, we've been asked to do it by the uh, by the law society. So I think we need to be clear that this is a law society initiative, uh, and uh, it's an initiative that was driven. I think it's fair to say by the um, inspiring la former president. Uh, Tiana Party, uh, who um, was president until earlier this year, uh, and who who presided over the society through quite a challenging um, term, uh, and uh, one of the first things that she needed to deal with it actually had happened in Catherine Beck's term was some of the fallout from what gets referred to as perhaps unfairly as the Russell McVeigh scandal, uh, because the issues that came to light in that case are, are much broader, I'm sure, than Russell McVeigh. But we did have this astonishing sight of law students marching in this from Victoria University of Wellington, marching in the streets. Uh, that, that looks like Molesworth Street or somewhere. Uh, it, it's saying, you know, it's time to change the culture of the legal profession. Uh, and obviously there have been disciplinary consequences that have followed from the specific incidents that um, came to light there, but more broadly, uh, concerns about sexual harassment in the legal profession, concerns about bullying, um, bullying of, of, particularly of, of junior lawyers uh, in, the, in the legal profession, uh, and a, a number of surveys showing that um, within the legal profession, uh, there are quite significant, you know, many people reporting poor mental health and, and well-being. We're not alone in this, in the legal profession. Many professions, they've got similar concerns, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't start thinking about it. So that was, that was part of the reason for thinking about needing to, to, to do things, um, you know, to, to look at whether the regulation and representation of the law society is sort of fit for purpose. For many of the lawyers who are tuning into this webinar, it may be that the only time, apart from um, you know paying your paying your um, practicing fees and and signing off that you've done your CPD, and that there aren't any other concerns, the one issue that we do all um, from time to time get a bit exercised by is if we face a complaint, uh, and uh, there have been quite a number of concerns being raised both from lawyers on the receiving end of complaints and from uh, you know, members of the public clients who make a complaint. I mean, the figures sit at about 87% of complaints, uh, no further action. And that's, that, that may well be happening for very good reasons in terms of the, the, you know, the lack of substance to the, the complaint. And yet we know they reflect unhappy customers. Uh, so uh, a sense that we've developed a, a system that's too prescriptive, uh, run by standards committees with wonderful, you know, members of the profession who don't who give their time to this task. But our complaint system is slow; it's not transparent, uh, and these are problems that that uh, also have partly prompted this review. New Zealand is starting to look, even though our statute's two thousand and six, which in the scheme of things is not that not that long ago. Uh, and yet it starts to look um, somewhat outdated uh, at a time when many other um, countries that we might like to compare ourselves with, England and Wales, Ireland, Scotland, uh, various states in Australia, recently British Columbia are embarking on reforms of their regulation. Changing expectations uh, about um, cultural competence in a diverse, diverse population uh, we see other regulators in the health sector uh, being 
you know, having the specific function of uh, setting standards for cultural competence. And in a bicultural country, in a multicultural country where we've got clients coming from so many different, uh, both Māori, but also other ethnic backgrounds, uh, how well are we, you know, are we competent to, to, uh, to serve them? What are the implications? Uh, specifically, we're asked by the Law Society to acknowledge how, how we should acknowledge Te Tiriti and by culturism in the statutory framework, something that's happening increasingly in, in other statutes, uh, but it's silent in the current uh, Law, Lawyers and Conveyances Act. Finally, how to promote innovation and competition and delivery of services. But these things are already happening. I guess the question is whether or not uh, the current framework is in some respects a little bit anti-competitive or is holding back because of, uh, you know, it's holding back the possibility of, of further competition. So uh, moving on, uh, I don't know whether I, yeah, outstretched palms, that's, that, that could be me saying help, uh, but it's, it, it, uh, it, uh, certainly, certainly uh, you know, very wide terms of reference. Uh, the big question about whether regulation and representation, which we've currently got in the Law Society, should be separated as it has been in a number of countries. Uh, the, the question about how to, un, unacceptable conduct is prevented and addressed, and, and we know there have been some moves already through the law, uh, through the rule changes in July last year. Talked about complaints uh, and looking at how they are handled. Which legal services uh, are to be regulated? Uh, <laughs> And because uh, at the moment we simply regulate, you know, we regulate the services provided by lawyers, uh, but there's a whole lot of other legal services and non-reserved areas uh, which are currently unregulated. The role of Titariti, which I've talked about, uh, and then the question of inclusion and diversity and how that should be expressed in the in the uh, in the statutory framework. So those, you know, those are the wide terms of reference that we've been given. So the review process, being a runner, I couldn't resist this round the bay slide. Uh, so we kicked off on the 1st of May uh, this year uh, with this task of looking uh, at whether or not uh, changes are needed. Uh, I do need to say, because we had a session with, uh, with a, a group on uh, a Tuesday night and uh, a comment was made, oh, do you have sort of predetermined views? And I know that government you know, often say, oh, well, we don't, in fact, they do. We don't. We we can see there are some issues with the complaint system. So you know, prima facie, there might be a case for changing the um, you know some changes there. And as as well, you'll hear shortly, um, some mainly people who have held office in the law society as presidents suggest that the the governance or maybe a bit unwieldy, even if you were to retain the current role. So, but even there, you know, everything we just approach it saying, well, this is what we're asked to do. Tell us what you think. Uh, we're in the middle of two months of consultation in this country. Um, happily, Jane Mears, who was in Europe, uh, and I had the privilege of making a special trip. We, we uh, went to London to meet with the vast array of regulators, the legal profession and legal services there. Uh, and also I went on to Dublin, where there's a Legal Services Regulation Authority in Ireland, uh, and to Scotland, where they've resisted reform. So we've, we're, you know, we're looking abroad, and we're also going to look, obviously, closer to home uh, at, at the Australian states, particularly Victoria, and New South Wales, uh, and to Canada, where British Columbia in particular has just started some new initiatives, um, a, a new review there. We've got to report to the uh, Law Society Board in, uh, in December, 16th of December, so we've got our work cut out. Um, and moving on, so just a tiny bit more detail. So there's a there's a picture of the 2006 Act. That's actually a slide I used to show in my legal ethics class uh, of um, very unhappy clients who had been defrauded, who had lost their funds. Uh, Renshaw Edwards uh, in Upper Hutt back in 1992. That was a public meeting. Uh, those of us who had practice certificates at the time will remember the $10,000 that we each had to, to pay. Um, and that was part of the prompt for the legislation. The other prompt was Phil Goff's mission to introduce conveyances. 
uh, and to to have consumer protection as a purpose of the act. And he got to see that through as Minister of Justice. Uh, and the act came in in 2006. But it doesn't set regulatory objectives, which is something that's, you know, increasingly uh, statutes that seek to regulate the provision of, of professional services will spell out functions of the regulator. This one doesn't. It's signed on Te Tariti. It's very much got a focus on protection of titles rather than risk to consumers. Doesn't permit alternative business structures or different corporate models. It doesn't regulate uh, it, the law firms, although the new rules have sort of found a way to try and get around that, but it just regulates individual lawyers. Uh, and as we said before, the model for handling complaints is, is quite prescriptive. So if we move on, I love this, this little uh, cartoon, Moses parting the Red Sea. What do you mean? It's a little bit muddy. Um, so um the com the current model it's not working it's it's got words in the statute about facilitation and conciliation and there's there is an early resolution service but for for various reasons uh including the requirement that everything goes to the standards committee that meets once a month it, it it's it's hasn't worked in that way um and certainly the decisions of the standards committee you know they're, they're not published and there's been criticism uh, or very, very, very few of them are, are, are published. Somewhat more of the LCRO, the Legal Review Complaints Office uh, decisions are published. Some of these are factors outside the Law Society's control. The Law Society found its hands tied when there was public criticism of its silence about what it was doing in the wake of the specific incidents at Russell McVeigh, uh, because it wasn't in a position to, to, to say what it was doing. So we're looking at options here for wholesale reform, um, but you know we've got an open mind about what that might be, uh, and and we might be convinced by your submissions that actually we should stick with the current volunteer system. Thank you. And I'll so, pass over to Jacinta. Kia ora, Ron, and tēnā tātou, nā mahi nui nui, kia koutou, tēnā koe whai mutu, um, and yeah, thank you for this opportunity. So the terms of reference, as Ron has already um, discussed with us, asks us to consider what changes are needed for a modern, well-functioning regulation and representation of our legal profession to promote several things, including a commitment to honour Te Tiriti and the bicultural foundations of this country, including Te Ao Māori concepts, inclusion and diversity, reflecting Aotearoa New Zealand's multicultural society, and a workplace culture of safety, health and well-being. So I'm going to very briefly um, talk to these points, starting with Te Tiriti. This image here on the page is one that's nearly 10 years old now. It's when it's a very historic moment. Uh, Justice Joe Williams was presiding in a ceremony uh, for the first time admitting five new lawyers uh, to, the, to the bar um, as lawyers and the whole proceedings were in te reo Māori. So it's a very historic moment and I think that really reflects the growing importance of tikanga and te reo, te tariti for us as lawyers and the practice of law in thinking more about how we serve the consumers of law, in particular iwi whānau and hapu as clients of law. So taking on this momentum um, and reflecting on the terms of reference that we've been asked to engage with here, one of the key questions we're consulting on is how should um, Te Tiriti be incorporated into the Act? Um, would it be useful to have an inclusion to Te Tiriti in the Act in a sense is would it act as a lever, an important lever to signal and invest in the importance of, for example, te reo and tikanga training for us as lawyers, um, decolonisation, um, and a question related to that is if yes, should that training then become compulsory, so should there be compulsory cultural competency training for us as lawyers? And I, that's a question that we are consulting on. And as Ron's already mentioned, that's been normal for the health profession for more than 20 years now. Um, Canada in more recent years is requiring cultural competency training now for their lawyers in British Columbia and Alberta. So that's a question we are asking. Also, by incorporating Te Tiriti into the legislation, would that act as a 
lever for better regulation and representative of Māori and the governance um, of the legal profession. It is normal for um, a regulator um, and commonplace in Aotearoa, New Zealand, for legislation, regulatory legislation to now incorporate expectations around Te Tiriti. So it would bring us in line with other um, regulators. So that's that's a, a live question that we are consulting on. I'll move to the next slide. So um, this is part four of our discussion paper. And just to emphasize that there are some working papers that are also available to view on our website. And there's two particular working papers that help um, bring alive some of these questions here that we're asking. So we know that there are significant barriers to admission, progression and retention within the legal profession for certain groups of lawyers, particularly barriers uh, for women, Māori, Pacific peoples, Asian lawyers and disabled lawyers. Um, and the, the statistics and data really show us that, um, you know, few Māori have been a QC, um, only 25% of the current QCs are women. No Pacific lawyer has been appointed to any senior court. And as far as we know, only one Asian lawyer has been appointed to a senior court. This um, image here is the current, it's the front cover image of our current annual report. And we know that Tiana, the past president, emphasized within her tenure as president um, the importance of young lawyers, junior lawyers coming through and worked hard to profile the diversity of the legal profession. And that question there, why are so many of the junior lawyers leaving the profession was a front page question on Law Talk a few years ago now. And um, we're interested in hearing from the legal profession around these continuing issues. And what is it that we could do? Does the regulator need new tools? The Cartwright report um, noted that regulation offers three um, opportunities to expose the legal profession to effective education programs. And one of those is CPD requirements. So is there a role here for CPD requirements um, to be to, yeah, to, to provide um, more, more training around cultural, around cultural competency, around anti-bullying techniques and so on. Is there an opportunity here to invest in greater data sets and longitudinal study to better understand the legal profession, to increase toolkits for us? And really just to conclude, um, in one of our working papers that is available for you to view, the New South Wales Law Society in 2021 is published a business case for diversity and inclusion in states in there, diversity and inclusion are practices that make sound economic sense for law firms and other organisations. So we're consulting on this and on what further steps are needed. Kia ora, I'll pass on to Jane. I'm Mahinui Jacinta. Kia ora, uh, koutou. Welcome everybody. It's great to have so many people listening in today. So one of the things um, I've particularly been tasked with looking at is whether there's a case for an independent regulator. Uh, as someone who, um, although I'm now at the independent bar, has worked in government, I've got an interest in what um, good regulation looks like. And it's certainly true that there's an international trend towards um, independent regulation of lawyers. So when we think of the Law Society, they issue us with um, our practicing certificate, uh, we have to do a declaration about our CPD. Um, we maybe interact with them. Um, if you're in a law firm, they might audit the trust account. But I don't think we necessarily think about the fact that uh, it's not only a regulator, but it's also a membership body. And, and it supports those membership um, things by uh, <clears throat> providing us with law talk and so on. But is there a tension between the two um, different arms of um, uh, of what they do. Should, would they, for example, be able to uh, lobby more effectively for their members if they weren't also trying to regulate us in certain ways? Um, there's also a perception, um, as far as the status quo is concerned, that the system is run by lawyers for lawyers, and that's one of the issues around the complaint system, that although lawyers provide a lot of their time voluntarily 
to uh, the standards committees, uh, has pe people comment that lawyers are sitting in judgment on themselves and that um, they're just running it for their own benefit rather than for the benefit of the consumer. Um, there's also issues around our practicing fees. They've, they've gone up recently, um, although not in real terms, as, it's, as is referred to in our working paper. But is a membership body keen not to um, set practicing fees at the appropriate level? That is, in a level that allows that regulation to be effectively undertaken. And would, uh, would um, greater advocacy result if the regulatory side and the membership side were separated? <clears throat> So we're consulting on a on number of options and government regulation that may, by which it means direct regulation by the government rather than through some sort of separate entity is not on the table. And the costs of uh, the various options that we are uh, looking at is something that we need to do some more work on because we wouldn't want to come up with a system that was going to end up uh, costing, in effect, consumers more money because inevitably the cost of practicing certificates get passed through. So the options we're looking at are whether we have uh, no change, so uh, Law Society continues as it is with its two uh, separate arms, um, functionally separating the two uh, units within the Law Society, so there will be separate governance, separate branding, separate powers, which is more along the lines of what's happened in the UK, for example, or whether in fact there should, uh, in, a, in a modern uh, society, be a new independent regulator. And I think, uh, as Jacinta has mentioned, there are some working papers uh, in relation to this on our website. And I think I'm right in recalling that the Teaching Council is the only um, Teachers are the only profession in New Zealand where both uh, the membership body and the regulator are the same uh, entity. In all other professions, be it medical or architects, there, has, there is an independent regulator and a separate membership body. So is that the way that lawyers should go as well? Or is there something special about lawyers? And um, a lot of people will, will cite the fact that the rule of law uh, is one of the reasons why it shouldn't be regulated by other than lawyers. Um, and those are some of the things we value your submissions on. And then as uh, has been referred to um, by both Ron and Jacinta um, earlier uh, today, um, I'm also thinking deeply, or we're all, we're all thinking deeply about what the governance arrangement should look like for a regulator or a membership body. There are possible issues with the current structure. Uh, elected governance is appropriate for a membership body and currently there's a 25 member council and that's fine when you've got a membership body, but the board, which is um, effectively the uh, strategic arm, if you like, of the Law Society, which interacts with the Law Society's chief executive and its senior leadership team, the board is elected, it's the president and four vice presidents. So that's on a rotating basis. Uh, and some people suggest that the, there needs to be more longevity around the board table, uh, a different uh, um, skill set, different uh, competencies, such as perhaps accounting or IT or HR, not to take the role of the chief executive, but to be able to provide strategic direction um, to the entity. Uh, and there are no lay members on the board. Um, if we acknowledge that consumers have uh, an interest in how lawyers conduct themselves and their interactions with consumers, with, with um, consumers, should consumers also be on the board? And as noted there on the slide, there's been a historic lack of diversity. And we're also interested in how a future governance structure might better reflect titiriti. As Jacinta mentioned, many statutes setting up uh, or establishing regulators these days in New Zealand will require uh, deference to be given to titiriti and recognition to it. So should that uh, be something that should change in how the Law Society um, governs itself? And if a membership body 
should regulate the profession? Is there also a case for Tehunga Roya Māori to have a greater role or even to have some statutory recognition? And what of um, other other groups and so on? So uh, how that might uh, um, turn to how that might result is probably very much um, driven by where we end on whether or not there should be a single regulator and membership body or whether there should be um, a, um, a split regulation. Um, but again, we really value your views as to what, what you think works well and what doesn't work well. So where to from here? Um, I'm going to go tramping in December. There I am. Uh, once the final report is uh, is submitted, but we in the immediate future, we're asking for your submissions. You can either do the survey, and it's one of those ones where you, you sort of rate on one to five. Um, it, you know, can't stand the idea of this through to a, yeah, I really like that. Uh, and you don't have to answer them all. You can skip through some of them. Uh, but some of you, I hope, will want to make a written submission, just, you know, a Word document or PDF, uh, and uh, both are welcome. So, uh, and you don't, you know, just tell us the bits you're interested in if you're not interested in the whole uh, shooting match. Uh, and we, you know, we're meeting, obviously, having these three webinars, but we are going to some of the various branches for, uh, for meetings. Uh, and, and organisations. We're also, you know, trying to talk through organisations such as Community Law Centres at Aotearoa and through Consumer New Zealand to try and reach out to the people who use legal services. So it's not just us talking to ourselves. So I think that's the end of the uh, slides. I look forward to hearing your views.